Nú eru alltaf að fá hana Pólu, Januskivits, til að segja okkur aðeins frá öryggismálum. Yfirskriftin Windows Techniques for Finding the CSI, Windows Techniques for Finding the Cause of the Unexpected System Takeaways. Pólu er svo sem orðin þokkalega þekkt hérna á Íslandi, búin að koma hans í oft, en hún hérna er reykur fyrirtæki sitt, Secure, hún er vinsæll fyrirleysari út um allan heim og ég held að stór rástefni í dag sem fjallar við öryggismál sé ekki öðru sem heldur hún sé að fengið til þess að tala þar og oft kosin besti fyrirleysari á þessu rástefnum hún hérna náttúrulega vinnur við það að við öryggi alls konar öryggisúttekti og training og hefur komið, ég veit ekki hvað hún sé búin að koma 10-15 sinni með þeim til Íslands allavega bæði að halda fyrirleysari á kenna En, heyrðu, ég ætla ekki þetta, ég vil bara bjóða velkomna svið, Pólu Jannuskvits. Já, þank you so much. Thank you very much, Gudmundur, for the introductions. I believe that everybody can hear me very well. Yes, I have no doubt about it from here. So, just, of course, a couple of words regarding the background. As Gudmundur mentioned, I'm the person that is playing with security. Uh, myself and a couple of other team members, we have access to the source code of Windows. And this is something that allows us to play a little bit more with Windows security. Uh, I'm also a speaker on different kinds of conferences. If you're going to be on Microsoft Ignite this year, I'll be technically there uh, as one of the speakers. And definitely, please feel comfortable. And thank you for your time. Thank you for coming. And uh, the session is going to be about a pretty interesting case that our team has participated in whenever we are playing with uh, security at the customer side. Actually, it was a simple inspiration for the session. The project was about this. Um, as a penetration tester and as a person that is strictly dealing with security-related projects, doing something that is popularly called hacking, uh, we call it more like researching, because hacking is qu quite not a legal thing, uh, we were asked by one of our customers to participate in a tiny forensic case. Well, maybe it wasn't very tiny, because they had a bunch of incidents. One of the incidents that they had is that within the two days they have lost four and a half million euros, which is plenty. I believe that you can buy a lot of good cars for that. And uh, they were quite desperate because their whole infrastructure, this was a factory, was going down. And they were wondering what was basically causing that. And what is the inspiration for the whole session? Is this particular case, and it appeared at the end that it was an administrator that was sabotaging the infrastructure from the inside. Quite a sad story, and it was very serious, and police was very much engaged into it, and so on. And our job was to find out the proof. And this finding the proof case, it's really always a difficult thing, because we technically don't know where to start from, right? This is the computer that is like placed in front of us, and we are like, yeah, so where should we touch at the beginning? I know that um, in uh, Iceland, within a couple of uh, days, and uh, this is my second week that I'm in Iceland right now, I have noticed that a bunch of uh, clients had actually problems with CryptoLocker. You don't have to, of course, admit, but uh, I'm sure that you have heard, because it was technically very much targeting uh, Iceland and Icelandic companies, and uh, there were some real cases that I saw and I participated within. And uh, the question is, how do we see that something is running in the certain computer? So let me dig into the small steps and the analysis that we can make whenever we are playing with this kind of malware, this kind of situations, or technically uh, tiny forensics. The tools that I will be using you can find out on the website. Don't get me wrong, I'm very bad at marketing. I'm just a technical person. But on the other hand, if you would like to do the stuff that I'm doing and you would like to repeat that, the scripts that I will be showing today, because I'm going to be doing forensics with PowerShell, uh, this is the script that uh, our team uh, wrote. And you can uh, technically find it over there. So everything is there. Small agenda for today. Fundamental research, let's discuss what kind of steps we can take to play with the, this. We got hacked, we don't know what to do, what should be the first step? Yes, think. Then we're going to talk about the situation. I will show you how to perform the live analysis. And then we're going to talk about the system mechanisms that are engaged into the whole malware process. First of all, uh, whenever we are thinking about operating system, I'm always giving an example of 
my grandfather, which is a very special person. By the way, uh, I'm from Poland, and Polish people have very... It's a, I think it's a nation thing. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love it, but at some point it's funny. Uh, and my grandfather example is going to show you that. So my grandfather went to the, we call it in Poland, Russian market. And technically you can buy everything for like one euro or something like that. And he bought himself a small radio, like a very small one, you know. And then he brought it home, he turned it on, and he's like, yeah, that works. Yes. Well, that is a price. And I'm like, okay, this is just, just a radio. So what he did, he took a screwdriver, he put it into pieces on this kind of like newspaper, very nicely organized each piece by piece by piece by piece by piece. And he's like, ah, now this is interesting. So he took all the pieces all together. Well, probably there was something left unneeded. And then he put everything together. Here comes the radio and he turned it on. He's like, ah, now it works. So technically, this kind of tiny example shows one tiny thing, that whenever we do have an operating system, and it's an hour operating system, you paid for it. No doubts about that. How can we not know what is inside? It's our operating system. So I should be totally knowledgeable of what kind of malicious stuff is running inside. And I'm very much with my grandfather at that point, because as long as it's the operating system that I paid for, how is it possible that I don't know the stuff that is running inside? So here comes the thing. Whenever we got a problem, we feel that we got hacked, there is this difference, like what kind of investigation should we take? Should it be geeks and take this computer and analyze it? Or, for example, the business needs it's so huge and the business impact is so huge that we should technically contact some legal uh, subsidiaries and technically create a case. So you make a decision because it's always about evaluation. Nah, nothing serious. Well, yeah, that's serious. We got hacked, our information gets stolen, and so on. But remember about one tiny thing. Always, after you got hacked and you want to do something and you make a decision, until the police comes, that's like at least a good couple of hours. It's not an emergency. They will not come to you in five minutes, which can be a problem. So imagine, I went to this factory site, and all of the active uh, directory domain controllers of these guys, they were completely collapsed. They stopped operating. Companies started to lose a lot of money. And then we came, and we, after the whole situation, as an emergency team, like, oh, you have to come, you have to come. So we are coming, and I'm like, okay, good. So uh, show me the memory dumps. Do you have them? It will be great to analyze it, and so on. And they're like, what? Memory dumps? So you know, from the consultant perspective, there is one thing that is the best. Like when a consultant comes to the customer site, you are getting paid for your days, but there is nothing to do. Isn't it cool? <laughs> So I came over there, and they're like, we have no memory demos. But luckily, we found one server that technically we could analyze. And that's where the whole party began. Make sure that after you got this situation, you're going to make a memory dump. To make a memory dump is very simple. There is a lot of different tools that are doing this. But there is one my life guiding sentence. Don't get me wrong, I'm very not a romantic person. And a life guiding sentence that guide me through all my life, it's whatever works is in the memory of the operating system, of course. So if you get hacked, technically evidence is clean out. If that happens about a day ago and so on, and you don't reboot your computer, the remains of that, that's going to be technically in the memory. And there's a lot of guidance that you can find in the internet when something happens, shut down the computer. Please don't do that. Everything is there in the memory. When you shut it down, it's no longer there. Disk is not a proof. So whenever we are thinking about this basic terrain orientation, there is a couple of things we can do. We are talking about the emergency behavior. You got hacked, something happened, and you are like, oh, wow, uh, where are we? Well, let's check out what kind of stuff we have. And technically, let's start from the easy things. So the very, very basic things. So whenever we have the situation that you feel that the connection was technically coming through the network somehow, 
obviously, we do have a bunch of techniques to check out where the connection is. The first of the basic commands is ipconfig, and you're going to be like, yeah, this is so easy. Wait a second, OK? There is a parameter. It's called display DNS. And display DNS shows you the information, what are the latest computers that this computer was communicating with. We always do flash DNS. We do ipconfig O and a couple of other things, renew, release, whatever. But display DNS, we kind of forgot about. It's like actually a pretty important thing. Question to you, just to warm you up after the very good lunch, how long this stuff remains in a cache? Haha, <laughs> torture yourself after lunch. <laughs> very good. So it depends on whoever configured the DNS. Yes? So if I'm the hacker, what do I care about? So it should be shorter, agreed? But sometimes, hacker might not even think about that. And there's always this cat and mouse games. We win, we lose. We win, we lose. We are like, ah, we know more. And hacker is like, haha, but I know more. And you're like, but I know more than more. Yes? So it's always about that. So basically, this is something that we should take into consideration. Maybe we're going to lose. OK, what's the next step then? Next step. Start minus A and O. What does it give us? Yes, of course we know what the net set is to check out the active connections, blah, blah, blah. But A and O option, it's actually very cool because it shows you the process ID related with the network communication made through your workstation or server, whatever. So we are able to analyze the process ID of something that is trying to communicate with the network. And if it's going to be SVC host, now the fun is starting. Because, uh, because SVC host is just a simple DLL runner, service hoster. So what if malware has a form of a DLL? Hmm. So technically, whenever we are thinking about such, there is obviously we can check out uh, the ARP tables. But ARP minus A shows us one tiny, quite not a useful thing. ARP lasts for two minutes. And when it's not renewed, it already lasts for 10 minutes, and then it's wiped out. So don't really look at this area, because probably it's going to be gone already. But this is one of the steps to play with. OK, let me take this out, and let's move along. Whenever we're thinking, of course, about the typical traces, where the information can be stored, well, there is a bunch of those. And that kind of analysis can be made by each of us, as long as we've got a good tool for it. And there is always this question, like, what are the good forensic tools? There aren't many. You sometimes need to write your own one. Sometimes, very often, you actually have to pay for it. So therefore, when PowerShell comes to the field, this is great, because we are able to analyze the whole thing. So where this information can be stored? Well, we know that we've got the, for example, cache things. Like, for example, when you do the run, then you have all the commands in the cache. Whenever you run software, you've got all the commands in the cache. Whenever you open MMC, there is a separate cache to maintain for the MMC only. Whenever you do the remote desktop connection, you can put your favorite remote desktop connection from the drop-down list. Where is it coming from? Cache. Where is this cache? In the registry. So why not to pull it? And I would like to show you one tiny thing regarding, of course, the whole, the whole uh, forensics at the beginning. And one more thing to mention. There is something that is called prefetch. Don't get me wrong, it's actually kind of funny. I'm quite ironic. Uh, actually, I'm always very ironic, not quite. And I'm reading all these kind of administrative forms, like good, cheap, terrible, and tips and tricks to your administrators to take care about your system. You know what I'm talking about? And then they're like, what are the best things to the list from your drive to save space? OK, MSO cache files and so on. And one of the files is, one of the places is prefetch. Yeah, you just save like 10 megabytes. Great. This is technically something useful that should be enabled on all of the computers. What is a prefetch? Prefetch is a history that is maintained globally on the computer that contains and maintains the history of all of the executables that you run. By the way, process tracking, it's not enabled by default. 
So you have no clue. If there is some executable that just run on your computer, you're like, oops, what just run? I have no idea. And sincerely, you have no idea because how can we tell? We can technically go to the registry and find out the cache, one of the options, but prefetch is pretty amazing about that. By the way, prefetch is turned off by default on the SSD drives. So if you have an SSD, you have it turned off. If you did not explicitly turn it on, turn it on. It's very useful, especially in the CryptoLocker times, when CryptoLocker will use at the end an executable to encrypt your files. How can you know that from this computer CryptoLocker run when it finishes its job? Network communication isn't happening, yes? But this tiny entry is gonna be there. And you're like, ah, that's Laura that click on this link. I know one Veronique, she did, and she never confessed. Of course, not a, not a surprise. She encrypted with CryptoLocker all of the files on the file server that were used by dealers dealing fuel in one of the companies. Nobody could work for half of the day. Cool. Okay, let's move on. So basically, let's do this tiny, tiny forensics. So what we're gonna play with? Let me go to the full screen. We're gonna, of course, do the whole demonstration with the PowerShell, don't worry, the script, I told you where you can download it. And technically, um, whenever it's about the whole tiny letters, I'm gonna enlarge it. So one thing to have a look at is to check out what kind of profiles, users' profiles are on the disk. But technically, will we really assume that hacker will leave his profile? No. So that is one of the steps. Maybe he will not smarter at that point than you are. But at that point, pro he probably will. So we see that we don't have much things. We've got admin, admin, shutter, Freddy, some public. OK, but there is one tiny place to look at. Whenever you delete the user profile, the profiles are stored in the registry. Yes? So these profiles are active profiles. The long names are profiles for the operating system accounts, local system, local service, network service. And of course, we do have a profile of administrator. Which one is this? Which one is the administrative profile? 500, thank you so much. Hey, that's not, that doesn't count, I know you. You're Active Directory Master. <laughs> okay, um, you're just a good guy. <laughs> okay, so, pro so the profiles folders from the registry, can we technically list that? Yes, and what is actually quite funny is that if you delete the profile, there is a leftover in the registry. So what about this? So hacker is like, okay, I'm going to delete the profile. Will he think about this? So that can be one of the proofs that when you look at that, you're like, oh, there is one profile left in the registry, but it's technically not on the drive. So now we are getting to the point. So what kind of other things can we search for? Yes, so we see that there was some hacker. Maybe we could continue on that track. Well, the name in a presentation sounds very obvious. It might be something else. But technically, we see that this doesn't match what was really on the disk. And who deletes really profile? Well, of course, we can. But hacker, for sure, we do that. OK, a couple of other things. We can also list for the current user the terminal services cache saved. Have a look, everything I'm doing is the PowerShell and I'm just querying the registry. By the way, these tools, these magical tools, and maybe it's a little bit of Polish approach, a little bit, all the tools that you pay a huge amount of money, they're not doing any magic. If there is something on the disk, something in a registry, you can, with the free tools, get to the points. They are just saving our times. Because if, for example, we're gonna use the Windows debugger, and you're gonna debug the memory, and then technically you do the deep analysis of the drive with the free tools, you can do this as well. But instead of just pressing, do the analysis for me, click, you spend the whole amount of hours on doing that. So it kind of makes sense sometimes, but in this case it doesn't. So what I'm listing right now, and this entry is empty, is all of the cache things that from the terminal services someone used. Okay, here comes the big part of the script. So you will get the script, as I said, on the website, so don't make me really to explain it. If you want, I can do that, but it's actually very simple. What we are doing, we are listing, as you see, the, end the information from the end user dot. End user dot, it's the registry hive of the user. It's simply a registry file. We are listing all of the um, profiles that we've got 
uh, in our operating system, plus we are listing the history of all of the connection totally from the certain drive. Okay, and we see that Freddy Krueger has logged on remotely to 10, 10 to 10. So here comes the very magic question. Who and what kind of stuff, well, who, we know that Freddy, what kind of stuff Freddy was looking for? He's not supposed to log on like that. Last year on this conference, I was talking about how to get the clear text password from the memory. And the reason why it was like this, because our team is uh, helping out Benjamin Delpy a little bit to develop the Mimikatz tool. I'm sure you heard about it. If you didn't, check out. It's called Mimikatz with TZ at the end. And it's a very popular tool right now, one and the only, to get the passwords from the memory in a clear text of everyone that logs on to Windows. Quite dangerous. So, whenever we are thinking about this, we can assume that this guy should never log on somewhere. So how can we check what this guy saw? Well, and again, um, my husband uh, is working in the same industry, by the way. And technically, uh, I'm always laughing that besides giving me a roses, he writes me a tool. Uh, and it's a little bit like that, really. Uh, it sounds creepy, but uh, at least the tool is working practical. You know, it's maintained. Okay, anyway. So this tool, uh, it's called RD Cache. You will find it in the tools area. It's used, and we wrote it because we could not find a tool like that. We wrote it to analyze cache. Let me change the, um, the width uh, in, the, in, the, in that particular file. The cache of the um, RDP cache. Let me technically open it up, make it bigger, decode it. Very good. And then let me, of course, ask a couple of questions. So what is cool is that RDP always, when you connect anywhere, you are in a vacation in Indonesia in this kind of crappy internet cafe and you are like, I'm going to do this connect remotely so that nobody can trace what I'm doing. Uh, quite unfortunate approach because you leave the old cache behind. RDP, by default, saves the bitmaps, tiny bitmaps, to the cache. And what is funny is that you probably noticed that in a slow link, when you use the RDP connection and you connect somewhere, it's kind of fast. Yes, why? Because it downloads the files, these bitmaps, and it reuses them again. So question is, what the Freddy was looking at? I know. It's terrible, but we have no other option. Yeah, I'm sure you saw that. Let me change the view, maybe. I'm going to decode it again. Oh. That should show a little bit better, maybe. Thank you. Exactly. So, Freddy was looking at IIS. Internet Information Services. So it's kind of interesting what he was looking for over there. Maybe we could go there and check. That's what we're going to do. But give me, of course, one second. Um, it's IIS. And of course, we can search for different kinds of things he was running. Like, for example, Windows R. If he was typing something in Windows R, definitely we can check that. MMC, Paint, Paint history, that's quite cool. If hacker was like in the middle of attack in the sense of painting some art, here we go, yes. Uh, recent things that someone was writing. And prefetch, let me show you prefetch because I was mentioning it. And it's actually quite interesting. First of all, we can obviously check if the prefetch is enabled or not. Let me very much enlarge it. And then we will be, of course, listing that. Then addition, the version three, the number three means the prefetch is enabled. And this is just a registry key. Now we can check if prefetch contains any files. And of course it does. As you see, it's a pretty long list. OK, so what then? What are these files about? Well, technically, these files, and let me also enlarge it, this is clearly a history of what you were running in, at all in general. Of course it will go bigger. But how many executables really you are running? You are running, let's say, calculator, and that's the only entry that you have. And then the next executable, and that's, so let's say it's going to be 300. You will not really go more than that because we are not using th more than 300 applications all the time, right? So let's move forward. And now we can do the small search, 
And uh, this tool, unfortunately, it's not for free, but either we could write our own one, either we could technically just pay $100, which was, I think, a good decision. There is a tool, it's called pf64.exe, and this is a tool that comes from TZ Works. TZ Works. And basically, this tool allows us for the analysis of what kind of and when tools were running. So if you're wondering, did the hacker maybe run the Mimikatz? Then you run it, and then it clearly shows you when this was run and what kind of DLLs were loaded. Don't get me wrong, all of these forensics tools, they have nothing to do with user friendliness. Actually, totally zero. Uh, and then you've got, but what to do? Uh, and then you've got the information that Mimikatz run two times. Great. This is when you enable prefetch. And you were like, well, what was the last run? And then you've got, of course, some dates. So what were the DLLs loaded? You see, of course, all of the things like that. So if there is a malware, an executable, we call it in the professional, not professional way, we call it melting. If you've got an executable, you run it. It, for example, only launches a DLL through SVC host, and then executable melts. Technically, it deletes itself, yes? So we here, we will see which executable was this and what was the related DLL. Lovely. So let me move to this technically server and let me find out what kind of stuff we have over there. So there is a lot of stuff that we can play with regarding forensics. It's always very interesting and it always requires a very deep research. But of course, let's, let's see what technically we can spot here. So this is an IIS, and there is not much related. I mean, there is a default website, there is a content view, and I mean, I've got a certificate, I got just a regular website. So what's wrong? But as long as we've got some trace, we can catch it, and then we can analyze anything that is around. So question is, can I have a web server or website running without IIS on my server? Yes. And can I, if I don't use Apache or anything like that, can I just have it just, just the website just like that, being servicing all of the customer requests, but no any of the web servers running? And you said yes, which was correct. There is some reason why I'm asking this question. There is a driver in operating system. It's called http.sys. And IIS consists of three things. HTTP.sys, which is completely independent from IIS, that's the guy that is loaded in a kernel mode that is speaking the web requests. Quite interesting. And there is, of course, worldwide web publishing service and Windows process activation service. The other two, the last two, they can be dead. But web server functionality will work. So here comes the thing. I'm going to run. CMD. Do you remember the tool? Quite old, I would say. It's supposed to be deprecated. Let's see how it's going to go in history, because I will not let the NetSH go. NetSH, yes. NetSH, it's the network tool that has, well, a lot of big context, quite a big context. And one of the contexts of NetSH, it is the HTTP. And HTTP context allows us to, I know, the tool has its own, you know, beauty. So it has this kind of context, add, delete, dump, flash, help, show. It, it, HTTP show, well, if you just enter it like that, it doesn't really tell you much besides a show service state and show cache parameter, cache state, IP listen. It's nice to, by the way, have a look at this tool because it's really powerful. And what it will show me, it will query directly HTTP.sys, passing all these IS things, and it will tell me if there is something listening and servicing the web service, the web queries, besides IS itself. So have a look. I'm going to use show service state. And right now, I can find out all of the things that are listening in my server. And that's actually quite cool, because IIS itself, 
and I can show you where is it. There's a, there is more than IIS, by the way, listening. And here we go, this is my IIS. So I do have over here, and as you see, contoso.com, having a binding on port 443, this is the last one, and of course, listening on defaults on port 80. And now we move to father. One of the things working on, on a port 5985, it's for example, remote server management. So when you do have WinRM, then this is something that is technically connecting to the web service. And here comes the question. I do have something that is called HTTPS pricing. Is this really responding? Let's see. And then I will show you the whole mystery revealed thing. So I'm going to go to the server. This is the HTTP, to, well, technically the website pricing. And let me refresh it to see if this web server is responding. And it's going to take a small while because HTTP.sys, it's not responding on a such a fast manner as the IIS because it's a kernel mode preparing me the whole request. There is no worker process doing it. It's coming directly from the kernel mode. This refreshed, I got a service working. You know what's best? That this innocent NetSH tells you exactly what are related process IDs with any kind of web queries. And technically, we've got two, 972 and 1592. So let's find it and let's sum up our presentation. So 972, was it this one? Yes. Uh, and another one is 1592. So SVC host and 1592, here we go, it's a run DLL32, uh, run DLL32.exe. What's the run DLL? Because sometimes it's actually two of the worst processes to analyze, SVC hosts and run DLL. Sometimes we're like, nah, this is OK. This is actually completely not OK. Because run DLL, as the name stands for itself, it's something that we are using to ta -ta 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 -ta, run DLLs. Yes? So badly written software and malware very often are using things like that. So Technically, as you see, there is a lot of hidden places in Windows that we can play with as, with, as a matter of this cybercrime scene investigation, so the CSI thing, and we are able to, by jumping step by step by step, search for the information that we need in the matter of forensics. Okay, guys. So, technically, whenever we are thinking about the whole approach with the CSI, please remember that it's always, of course, good to have this proactive activity. Activity. So we need to be prepared for crypto locker. Crypto locker is hitting Iceland. I'm sorry, I know it. It's terrible, I know, and it's very hard to prevent that. If you will not have a backup of your data, technically, you will be very lost. Previous versions, this is something that is helping out to recover the data from the past couple of minutes. We do have also things like the log subscriptions. Check out, find this information and be prepared instead of doing the forensics, which is always about digging in the trash bin. My purpose of this session is to show you couple of techniques that we can use whenever we are thinking about this first analysis after the situation, so technically after the crypto locker. And my purpose of this presentation was to present to you the typical areas where technically malware can be in, and also to make you a little bit more alarmed to something that is coming to you right now. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed it. Takum Pólu kjærlega fyrir þennan fyrirlestur. Ég held að því miður þá þú fór nú yfir þá höfum við ekki tíma fyrir spurningar. En uh, hún verður nú væntanlega hérna uppi í bástu mynda beint á móti. Getur svaka spurningum. You will be in the booth. Yes, yes, I will be uh, technically at the prominent booth. Yeah. Um, if you would like to come and talk, it will be great. Uh, I'm also delivering courses in Promant, so I'm happy to, to share some information about it as well. Thank you so much for your time.